Welcome to Follow Him, a weekly podcast dedicated to helping individuals and families with their Come Follow Me study. I'm Hank Smith. And I'm John, by the way. We love to learn. We love to laugh. We want to learn and laugh with you. As together, we follow Him. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Follow Him. My name is Hank Smith, and I am here with my faithful co-host, John, by the way. Hi, John. <laughs> Hi, Hank. <laughs> you are ever faithful, John, by the way. Hey, um, we want to remind everybody that you can find the podcast on social media. We have a uh, we have an Instagram page. We have a Facebook page. Our wonderful Jamie Nelson runs those. So come on over and check out all the extras that we have there. Uh, if you want to watch the podcast rather than listen to it, you can find it on YouTube or the Our Turtle House app. Uh, and if you want to go to our website, follow him dot co follow him.co and please take time to rate and review the podcast that really helps us out you know hank just last night i was talking to somebody who did not know that on the follow him.co website not only does it have something called show notes with kind of like a list of references but it has an entire transcript and they're like what people didn't know yeah you i mean this thing's gonna be a book when we're done right there's a <laughs> transcript if there's something you missed you want some extra details go get that transcript and I, I need to review them because i forget half of what we talk about and it's so nice to have the that uh, resource there so i just wanted to throw that in okay good Thanks, John. Um, now, uh, we are moving right along in the Doctrine and Covenants. We're getting towards the end. We're in the triple digits on these sections. Uh, <laughs> and we have a wonderful guest with us today. John, who's with us? Yes, uh, Hank, thank you. Today we have uh, Dr. Franz Below. Dr. Below was born in Haiti. He was raised in Montreal. He served a mission in Birmingham, Alabama. And he married Brandy Goodson, and they have five boys. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> and he is the co-founder of Typhoon, a mobile-first platform that documents and improves safety, communication, productivity, and training. And from 2011 to 2015, he worked with Imagine Learning, which provides a complete suite of, of adaptive digital curriculum and assessment solutions for pre-K through 8th in language development. Dr. Below obtained his PhD from BYU in educational leadership with an emphasis in organizational behavior and his educational pension permeates all aspects of his life. He's passionate about helping people access education and training so they can decrease skill gaps and positively, positively impact lives, businesses, and communities for good. And Hank, you have a personal connection. Why don't you explain that? Well, yeah. Uh, He's now president below in my stake presidency. And this happened after I asked him to be on the podcast. Because honestly, John, if, if if he would have been present below my stake presidency, I don't think I would have had the guts to ask him uh, <laughs> to come onto the podcast. But uh, yeah, I first met Bishop below as a member uh, when I was a member of the high council and I was able to work with him and his word. Just so impressed. I've always told him if we if we could nominate apostles, this is who I would nominate. Uh, and he always says no. No, no, no. Uh, and but I, I anyone who knows uh, he and his he, his wife would know these are these are pretty incredible people. So welcome, Franz. Thank welcome you. To our podcast. Yeah, we're excited to have you here. What yeah, was it's a um, pleasure? What was a mission in Birmingham, Alabama like? Oh, that's a good question. I um, I came from Montreal where there was a lot of um, it's a melting pot. It's a lot like New York City. Um, but it's French, right? And uh, so when I went to Birmingham, Alabama, I was surprised by the segregation, to be honest with you. Um, um, so that took me a little bit by surprise. But then after this, the more you got to know the people, the more you realize that uh, we were all the same, just trying to make the best out of, out of life with the knowledge that we have. I came to love uh, the people of Alabama and um, I'd, I'd, I'd go again, like people say, because it was such a wonderful place to be. Uh, very warm culture. There's a reason it's called the Bible Belt. They do believe in God. And uh, that was always uh, great to, sp to be speaking with them. Right. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't know you served your mission there. So, uh, yeah, I bet you have some good stories. Yeah. Um, Hey, let's uh, let's jump into our lesson this week. We are covering a bunch of sections, right? Uh, one fifteen through one twenty. 
uh, these sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. So, uh, Dr. Below, Franz, how, how far back do we need to go? What do we need to understand before we jump into 115? Oh, great. So I, I always try to try to understand a little bit of the context that we're, we're jumping into when we read the scriptures. Um, so I read a few things in Revelation and context that I may, uh, that I'd like to share to kind of give us an idea of what's going on uh, when we jump into section 115 through 120. Um, so if that's okay with you, I'd like to just share a few things that, that, that are happening here. Um, one of the things is that during the final months of 1837, apostasy began to affect the church in, Cape, in Kirkland, right? And many Latter-day Saints were disillusioned by the financial losses, and there were heavy financial losses as the result of the Kirtland uh, Safety Society. And they also began to reject, because of that, they began to question the leadership and the prophetic mantle of the prophet Joseph Smith, because temporarily things had been very difficult and also they were seeing a lot of people going um losing their faith for multiple reasons so and what made it even more challenging you had uh dissenters who were uh, that were members of the quorum of the 12 apostles and the 70s and as well as the three witnesses of the book of mormon so you're you're looking at this situation and you're it's a brand new church and and uh, you're looking at this and you're like, okay, what's going on here? Some of the apostles are are apostatizing, the three witnesses are disillusioned as well. And it's a it's a very tenuous t- times for uh, for the saints at this moment in time. And I would dare say for the prophet Joseph as well, he must have been spending a lot of time on his knees. That would be, I can't, I can't imagine. Can you, John, what, what would it be like to see the leadership of the church start falling off? I, you, you would need this kind of steadying voice. Um, you would need revelation to let, you know, Hey, I, I, this isn't Joseph's church. This is mine. I got this. And yeah, that this would be a shaky time. And you're mo- you're constantly seemingly on the move. No, we'll build here. Now we'll build here. No, we'll build here. <laughs> I think that's a good point that you just brought there, John. Um, that that was causing a lot of um, the contention was so difficult that they did have to move. So, um, in some of my notes, I also noted that in 1838, so the 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 apostasy had become so widespread, as well as the threats of violence towards the Prophet Joseph Smith, that um, Signe Rigdon and himself received divine instruction to abandon their labors in Kirtland and to flee to far west. So another move, right? Like you were saying, John, there's another move. Um, and um, so once they were in Missouri, it's uh, it says here that although the revelation pronounced Joseph's labors finished in this place, leaving Kirtland meant parting not only from their homes, from the church, but from the church's largest stake and its first and only temple. So you're looking at a group of people that have sacrificed so much to build the Kirtland temple. And the Lord is saying, uh, this is time to go. And he says, arise and get yourselves unto the land, to a land, which I shall show unto you, even the land flowing with milk and honey. So this is the context that we're getting into in the sections 115 through the 120 that we'll be talking about. Can you imagine leaving that behind? I mean, Joseph Smith is coming off the best year of his life with 1836 and everything goes sour uh, in 1837 and 1838. And he has, he's, he has to move to Missouri. Far West is a city that was basically, it's almost brand new. Uh, it was created when the saints were driven out of Jackson County and they were spending those years in Clay County, uh, it's Alexander Donovan who um, their lawyer helps them create a county for them to live in. And they build this city of far West. And I, <laughs> I mean, good thing we did that because Joseph's got somewhere to go. Um, uh, this is a, a brand new city for Latter-day Saints. Uh, and here Joseph um, needs somewhere to flee to and, he has it. And all the saints in Kirtland need somewhere to flee to. So, um, And I just man. think of the, the, ti- the name of the place, 
No, this is not just west. This is far west. I mean, we are going way out there. And uh, and for all of us, we're going, hey, you're going to be going a lot farther west pretty, right. pretty soon, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, and finally, they're just going to go so far that nobody can bug them for a while. Yep. But. Uh, so Joseph, is, I think, arrives in Far West uh, in the beginning of 1838, and now yes. um, he's receiving revelation. Yeah, he's uh, so. So this is again the resilience of those individuals, right? I mean, we we talk a lot about the prophet and and um, and the revelations that he's been uh, receiving, but we also have to think about the man here. Um, it's it's not easy to leave a home and then to go somewhere else. Plus, he had a wife and children and so on. And then all of a sudden, he has to rebuild a lot of things. So, so here, they, I've learned that they, they were making plans for a new temple. So, that's again speaking of the resilience. Okay, we left Kirtland. We got to make a new temple. They also were able to call new apostles, Right. Which again is a testament that the Lord does not um, um, just let people stop his work. He inspired Joseph to call some of the greatest apostles and future prophets of the church, such as John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, uh, who would become later uh, become presidents of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. So you see there that the Lord is, is still in control, like John was saying, that. We got this. I mean, this is difficult. They're making decisions not to pursue and and remain faithful to to the covenants they've made. But the Lord has already prepared additional men, and I would say women, to pick up the baton and to move forward. And And now we jump into those sections and see what the Lord is saying to those great men. Yeah, both of these, John Taylor, Wilfred Woodruff, I mean, this is, these are huge names in our history. And they come into the quorum because of this apostasy. That's a great point. From that comment that you say, Hank, it again reminds me that difficult things, many times, especially if we follow the Savior, uh, turns out for our good. So it's more than just a saying or uh, uh, on a sticker. It's actually reality. And I've experienced this in my in my life as well. So just wanted to add that part. Yeah. Often the most difficult part of our lives uh, are what did, I think President Uchtdorf called them. They, the Lord can turn them into stepping stones to future opportunity. All right. Let's uh, jump into 115. Tell us what you want to do here. So this, this, the heading tells us a little bit what's, what's happening, right? It's an, on April 26, 1838. Um, so, so the saints are wanting to know what to do. There seems to be a little confusion as to what should be the name of the church. Uh, does that remind you of something? <laughs> right. <laughs> In the last few years. <laughs> yeah. But uh, there's a little bit of confusion that's, that's happening there. And the Lord is also stating the purposes of stakes, right? Uh, what Because at this moment in time, the new stakes are being, uh, there's one in Kirtland, obviously, but there are new stakes. Many members are moving in far west, so there are new stakes that needs to be established. So the Lord is providing some additional instructions on what's, what's happening there. A few, a few things in verse 3 and section 115 it says, and also unto my faithful servants who are on the high council of my church in Zion, for thus it shall be called, and unto all the elders and people of my church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, scattered abroad in all the world. And then the Lord makes a statement here. For thus shall my church be called in the last days, even the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I think it's a powerful statement coming from the mouth of the Lord himself, well, through the prophet Joseph Smith, but it's a revelation that the, the Lord gives the prophet Joseph Smith, stating exactly what the church should be called. Yeah. I, and I, I really like this. Um, I remember not knowing this for a long time, that we had different names. Uh, and then, you know, all of a sudden I've realized for a while we were the Church of Christ, and then we were the Church of the Latter-day Saints. <laughs> and then we become the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I like that. I like that we went from, yes, this church is about him. It's also about us. And now it's about 
all of us. I really like the the progression of almost a line upon line uh, knowledge there when it just comes to the three names we've we've had. The Church of Christ, the Church of the Latter-day Saints, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I think it's just, I think that's wonderful. And then he says, uh, now arise and shine forth. I just, that's a great moment there. He announces the name of the church and says, arise, shine forth, be a light to the world. And I, I think this is a great, uh, very affirming from the Lord. People are feeling very shaky and the Lord comes out and says, uh, as as Franz said, I, we got this, I've got this, and this is what you're going to call the church. I mean, that's a message of we're, we're moving forward. And um, I did, when, in my Book of Mormon class, I kind of researched, what is the name of the church in the Book of Mormon? And I was, I, I have a PowerPoint slide of them, I can't remember all of them, but the one that was the most used was the Church of God. It's like 31 times in the Book of Mormon. Um, but here, the Lord names it. I don't think any of us would have picked a name this long. <laughs> um, but I think, like you said, Hank, uh, it, it's so. The, I, I underlined in my in verse three and in verse four. I love that Jesus calls it my church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. I was like, wow, that's listen. He's owning it. This is my church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints in verse three and. Uh, like you said, Hank, it's not, it's also our church. It's the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, it's ours too. And um, I, would it be okay if I read a paragraph from President Nelson in his talk that when he kind of gave us that, I, I love the way he said, this was a strong voice of a prophet. This is the third paragraph of that talk called The Correct Name of the Church. And President Nelson said, some weeks ago, I released a statement regarding a course correction for the name of the church. I did this because the Lord impressed upon my mind the importance of the name he decreed for his church, even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As you would expect, responses to this statement and to the revised style guide have been mixed. Many members immediately, immediately corrected the name of the church on their blogs and social media pages. Others wondered why, with all that's going on in the world, it was necessary to emphasize something so inconsequential. That's in quotes. And some said it couldn't be done, so why even try? Let me explain why we care so deeply about the issue. But first, let me state what this effort is not. And there are five bullet points. It is not a name change. It is not rebranding. It is not cosmetic. It is not a whim. And it is not inconsequential. Instead, it is a correction. It is the command of the Lord. Joseph Smith did not name the church restored through him. Neither did Mormon. It was the Savior himself who said, For thus shall my church be called in the last days, even the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I loved how strong that was. This isn't yes. a rebranding. This isn't cosmetic. It's not a whim. I love it. That's that's a beautiful thing for me. Um, it changed. I, I don't even remember who showed this to me once, but there is a call to be better in the name of the church. Right. It's the church of Jesus Christ. And you need to be a saint. <laughs> and uh, for me, it's the church of Jesus Christ of I really want to be a Latter Day Saint. Right. I really do. I'm trying. <laughs> right. It's a, it's, a, it's a name that we aspire to. <laughs> yeah. I really want to be a Latter Day Saint. I really do. <laughs> I, I love that, Hank. I, I do, too. I I mean, wherever I go, I'm like, I just want to be better. I just want to be gooder, if that's the word, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you just, you Saint just her. trying I to be center. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so, and you want to be around people that are doing their best because life is so difficult at times. Um, so, yeah, I want to be a Latter Day Saint. And if I could go back to one of the comments that you made, uh, Hank, is is the Part that it, in verse five, where, where it says, verily I say unto you, oh, arise and shine forth. Um, well, you can think of this also that the Lord wants his church to shine. And with what John said, quoting President um, Nelson, the Lord wants people to know that he does have a church here on this earth. And if I can go back to that talk, John, because I, I did some highlights there too. At one point, President Nelson says, quote, 
Consider this from his perspective, the perspective of the Savior. He says, Primortally, he was Jehovah, God of the Old Testament. Under the direction of his Father, he was the creator of this and other worlds. He chose to submit to the will of the Father and to do something for all of God's children that no one else could, could do, conden condescending to come to the earth as the only begotten of the Father of the and in the flesh. And then he says, after all that he had endured and after all he had done for humankind, I realize with profound regret that we have unwittingly acquiesced in the Lord's restored church being called by other names, each of which expunges the sacred name of Jesus Christ. And then he continues, when we omit his name from his church, we are inadvertently removing him as the central focus of our lives. And that is a powerful statement. For me personally, that was the, that was the part that kind of woke me up. Cause at first I'm listening to this talk. I'm like, well, that's nice. You know, you just want to, um, focus on the church and so forth and give it the proper name. But it's when President Nelson said that if we omit him as the central part of the church, and I'm like, well, that is one thing I do not want to be guilty of. I want people to know it's the Church of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints. And uh, that really touched me when I heard that, and especially that scripture, when he says, thus shall my church be called. Nice. I thought that was very interesting. I love it. Um, and th the reason we have a modern prophet, I try to teach this to my students uh, at BYU, is uh, we have this because we need revelation adapted to our circumstances. You know, someone might say, oh, was President Monson wrong? And in, in when he said, you know, dare to be a Mormon or President yeah, yeah. was he wrong? No, they weren't wrong. The Lord uh, said, look, circumstances have changed. We have revelation according to the circumstances. That's why we have a living prophet. So I was, yeah, I think the Lord saying, yeah, it's time to make a course correct because things are going to change. Your circumstances are changing and uh, this is going to be a, a, this is going to be a needful thing. No, I would just say uh, one more thing is I love that they have gone through probably 1838. I think um, 37 and 38 is going to be a dark, dark time for the church. Um, and I think this is almost like a reset for them. I think this is great that, that, you know, the Lord has given them a chance to kind of have a new, a new slate and said, Hey, we're going to, uh, a, a new name will kind of give you a fresh start. He does that for us, right? When we get baptized, we get a new name. When we go to the temple, we get a new name. And the idea is it's a fresh start. You're a brand new person. So I think that this, they've gone through a really dark time and here's a moment of, all right, uh, a new name, fresh start, new apostles. Like you said, let's. Uh, let's get going. Let's continue forward. So uh, I think it's a little, uh, maybe a shot in the arm of energy. What were you going to add there, John? Yeah, I just, uh, I totally agree. I, I remember I was listening to a post game, uh, show, uh, uh, after a basketball game and it's kind of, I think it might be kind of a common saying in sports, but the coach said, uh, well, my team lost today because they played for the name on the back of their jerseys instead of the name on the front. And uh, I thought the idea that when we take upon us the name of Christ, we become members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So we try to be to be that light to the world mentioned in verse five. And so I've always loved that that idea. And another thing I was going to mention is that we we don't want the world to be confused about who we are. And I've heard this story. I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but you may have heard it too. I'd love a source if somebody out there has it. But that during uh, Hurricane Katrina a few years back, and, you know, we've just had a hurricane recently, but that somebody said, oh, the only organizations that came to help us were the Mormons and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, I've always, what, I, I love the source on that, but yeah, we're, we're confusing the world. Who are we? Uh, and we want to make sure that they know. Um, it was one of those when President Nelson gave the talk that I, inside, I kept saying, of course, of course, of course. That's the revelation. This is what Jesus said to call the church, you know? <laughs> so the part that, uh, and another part of the section 115 that, that's interesting is, 
is is uh and i think that's hank you're the one who said that it's a new beginning right so the lord again in verse 8 says therefore i command you to build a house unto me for the gathering together of my sins that they may worship me at this moment in time in 1838 um there was approximately the population was about 4900 um uh, people with uh, it says about 150 50 homes so there there was a lot going on and the lord wanted to make sure that that the people would go would be able to be endowed with power just like the experience in kirtland he wanted them to follow um uh, the pattern that he had given them so in verse 14 if you look it says but let the house be built unto my name according to the pattern which i will show unto them so again the lord is taking control right of wanting to make sure that the saints know that what are the priorities here uh, for me when i read that scripture i know the priorities you know we 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 were missing apostles the lord calls apostles right and uh we left a place where the temple was the Lord says we need to build another temple. So it, it gives you kind of a sense of the prophetic priorities um, in that revelation. That same phrase is in section 97, verse 10. I thought we've heard that before. And yeah, the footnote to 14 there, DNC uh, Doctrine and Covenants 97, 10, according to the pattern, Lord has a pattern. And and help help me out here, Hank. So there is a temple in Kirtland. Did they did they find a site in Jackson County, or is this only the second time they've been commanded to build the temple? No, they they did find a site in Jackson County. If you remember, they dedicated the site on the hill, right? Uh, but never started it. Never happened. Never started it. So and this, this is, is the is gonna third be there. time. Okay, yeah. this, this is the, the third, third time spot. build a house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this uh, this. Uh, this temple area, uh, they they actually dig out the foundation for it, and uh, that area is still there. It's that gated area. If you go out, right, the and there's four part stones. Of and there's nothing. Yeah. There's there's not hardly anything else there. It's beautiful rolling hills, right? And this gated area with four stones and a restroom. I mean, yeah. It's interesting that there used to be a town of what? What did uh, President say right there? Uh, or Front what said did you say? A town 100? of almost five thousand people. Five thousand, exactly. Yeah, far so west, and there's thousand. nothing there today. Yeah, you'd think there would be some cabins left over, or, right? But, yeah, but it there's just looks nothing. like beautiful rolling hills. Yeah. yeah, it's a plowed through field. I have a question for you, uh, Franz. That he talks about how a stake can be a defense and a refuge, and you just were put into the stake presidency uh, in. Uh, in Mapleton, Utah. Um, have you learned anything about this idea of a stake being a defense and a refuge from the storm? Um, because that's how I, you know, I, of course, I have a bias, but I love the the stake you and I are in. I, I, I do see it as a as a refuge from the storm, right? I'm surrounded mm -hmm. by friends. And uh, so have you learned anything about uh, how a stake can be a protection for the the people. Uh, what have you? What Very have you good learned, question, I Hank. Yeah. I, I I have to say that in my last three weeks, right? <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I've been. It's been. It's only been three weeks. I'm sure there's so much more uh, to learn, but I, I can share with you that we've been um, spending a lot of time in in meetings um, and extending calls and so forth. And when we do so, there's a lot of prayers that go into this, and and asking ourselves, how will this individual? Uh, benefit this individual for this calling, but at the same time asking how it will um, um, benefit other people too. So, so the thought is always, how will whatever we do bring souls onto Christ, right? That or or help them with their exaltation and salvation, or keeping them on the covenant path. However, you want to say it, it's it's always it's always with that intent that we administer in a stake. And I would assume in, in, in all the stakes, that's some similar thoughts that are, that are going. But when you go to the Lord with this intent, you are creating some type of a re refuge. You are preparing like Captain Moroni, the right defenses that are needed, the tower that you need to build. You, you hear from the members and from the bishops and from the high counselors and the great sisters um, what is going on? And you, you, you pray and ask the Lord, how do we help 
in those areas. So it becomes a very proactive work and also uh, to foresee, especially as we listen to the prophets and the apostles, to foresee the type of calamities that may be coming our way and to put in place the right defense. So defenses. Anyway, that's that's a great question, but that's what I've observed in the last three weeks. I love that. I just love the the, the idea of this group, this area of the church being its own little refuge. I just think that is so. And and of course, you know what? At the time, we have a couple of stakes where today, I, John, I don't even know. You might know how many stakes are there? Uh, thousands of of th- of these these refuge, right? The these these defenses for people to kind of go to and have that have that protection. I love the idea. It's the the, the world is dotted with thousands of these. Just last night, I attended a you know award picnic and. You know, seeing all those uh, happy, smiling faces, knowing they're, that each one of them are having trials, medical trials, family trials, everything else. And just seeing the, just being gathered with them felt like a refuge. These are, we are all in the same boat and we are pressing forward and, um, and we're happy and we're eating food and everything. But I, as, as a former bishop of that ward, I, I knew a little bit about what some were going through. And, and what a refuge just to be able to meet with each other. And so maybe that's another way to think of it all. Just as you said, President, how, how will this call help others? And, uh, and to be able to look around and say, I'm so glad they're here. I'm so glad they're faithful. It strengthens my faith to see us all in this together. Yeah. The Lord mentions that twice, John, and that the gathering together upon the land of Zion, that's verse six. And then again, in verse eight, the gathering together, the building of the temple, the gather together, their strength in coming together. Can I uh, say something on verse 19? Um, It it kind of buttons up the, uh, the, the section 115 when the Lord reveals again through the prophet Joseph Smith, for behold... Uh, speaking about the prophet Joseph, there there were, as you know, uh, by April uh, eight, 1838, both, uh, let me just make sure that I don't misspeak here, but both um, Whitmer and Cowdery were excommunicated uh, by April, early April 1838. And um, I can only imagine that those were the friends of the prophet, right? And uh, close associates, they had seen and felt they have, had heard the voice of God, uh, they knew, they knew. And um, uh, like you were saying in the beginning, Hank, this this is a very difficult time for the prophet Joseph Smith. And we need to remember that this, this with all his, of his great abilities and qualities, um, those are not di- those are not easy moments for the man himself, right? Those are not easy moments, and um, and I love the fact that in verse uh, nineteen, the Lord recognizes the prophet Joseph Smith, and uh, he strengthens the fact that he is the Lord's prophet, regardless of his weaknesses. He has been called, and the Lord says again, "For behold, I will be with him." And I will sanctify him before the people. That already tells you that, of course, Joseph needed needed some work, but so do I. So do all the millions of people that are in the church and outside of the church. So the Lord says again, I will sanctify him before the people. For unto him, I have given the keys of this kingdom and ministry, even so. And then the Lord says, Amen. So, so I feel the spirit of this, of the Lord uh, sustaining himself, his prophet, knowing that he's been going through a very difficult time and asserting or confirming to the people that this is my prophet. He does have the keys. I have given him those keys. So I love that way that this section ends. It really is, it buoys me up and I'm like, Way to go, Joseph. Way to go. Yeah, that's fantastic. And it, it ends so positive. And I like what you said there. I wrote it down. The Lord sustains his prophet, gives him a 
right? He's still who he is, uh, despite what anybody else is doing, even Oliver Cowdery or David Whitmer. Uh, he is, I am with him. I will sanctify yeah. him. It's like, it's like, this is my church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he is my prophet. I will be with him. I will sanctify him. I have given him the keys. That That is a... Really, I'm really glad you called that verse out. And uh, Hank, wasn't you who mentioned before how nicely some of these sections end? It's just the Lord leaves everybody with a, you know, <laughs> and and I, I really want to apply that to me. I really want to say that um, I want the Lord to say, I will be with him. I will sanctify. Oh, that just sounds for Joseph must have been nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like you said, um, Franz, I will sanctify him. It's like, yeah, he's got some more work to do. <laughs> but that's what I do. I remake people. I make the yes. creatures, you know. <laughs> yes. yes. So I love it. I love it, too. Um, I've got to mention one thing uh, before we leave, leave this section. One of my favorite stories from church history, actually. Um, if you look at verse uh, 11, the Lord says, in one year from this day, let them recommence the laying the foundation of my house. Um, and there's uh, in one year from this day is going to be April of 1839. They like They're marked this be... on their calendars, right? On their... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're supposed to be at, in far west in one year's time, April of 1839. But the problem is over the next year, they get driven out of the state of Missouri. So. Um, you've got Brigham Young over in Illinois saying, well, we're supposed to be in far west on this day, this April 26, 1838. And um, I, I, I shouldn't act like I, I know all this. I'm getting it all from Alex Baugh. So, Alex, if you're listening, uh, another shout out to you. He's the one who taught me this, um, that uh, there were some who said, no, Brigham, you don't need to go. Um, you don't need to be there. The He said the will is the deed, meaning you know, the Lord understands you want to be there. But if we go back into Missouri of this in April of 39, you're going to get in, you know, you could put your life in danger by going back. But uh, there's Brigham Young saying, no, this has to happen. So, um, in fact, there's a man, uh, an apostate member of the church named Isaac Russell, who says that is a prophecy that will not get fulfilled. Right. He just absolutely says it, it will not get fulfilled because they've been driven out of the state. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Brigham Young takes uh, some members of the 12. They sneak in in the middle of the night. <laughs> they it's are a great there. story. Yeah. As, <laughs> as midnight turns over, they are there a year later on April of, of 39. They put the cornerstones in place. They they set apart Wilford Woodruff as an apostle, um, and they sneak back out. They sneak back out wow. into Illinois. And I got to tell I you this. I did not know that. Oh, this is a great story. Yeah. So there's this a man, is an awesome story. <laughs> there's a man named Theodore Turley who is with him, and he just can't leave without telling Isaac Russell <laughs> that they fulfilled the prophecy. So as they're going back into Illinois, he actually stops at Isaac Russell's house, the apostate, knocks on the door, uh, sister, uh, sister Russell opens the door and says, it's brother Turley. And, and, uh, Isaac T Russell comes out. What? It can't be brother Turley. And brother Turley said something to the effect of, we've just been over to the temple site with the 12 and we're heading back to Illinois. <laughs> Almost like a, ha ha, we did, we fulfilled the prophecy moment. It's a great moment. Yeah. yeah, the theological of, term yeah. for that is neener neener, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, this idea of we want to make sure this prophecy happens, that, that you know, that ought to be a movie. That's a fun little story. <laughs> yeah, they sneak over. I just think it's, it's, it's a classic, classic moment in the middle of the night. But Brigham Young, I think he, he was the one who said, Joseph made a prophecy and I work to fulfill it, right? That's my <laughs> job. And I, again, I got to thank, thank Alex Baugh for that. He's the one that... Uh, that told me that story. I don't know if it's well known, but it is with Alex because he, you know, he knows everything is, uh, as you know. All right. Well, I'm, are we ready to move on? Uh, from yes, what do we want to do next? One. Yeah. Section 116. I mean, it's a short, uh, section, uh, a little bit of the background on this that I've learned is that they came to a pro prominent knoll or a little hill mound, if you will, called Spring Hill. And on this trip, Joseph received the revelation known today as the Doctrine and Covenant Section 116, which again 
um, identifies the region, Adam and I, Amen, uh, because said he, it is the place where Adam shall come to visit his people or the ancient of days shall sit as spoken of by Daniel, the prophet. So it's a great, um, I mean, it's a needed section, right? I've asked myself, okay, what it's only one verse, right? It's a revelation given to the prophet Joseph Smith. But again, it talks about, about prophecies, right? Hank, the Lord says that Adam shall come to visit his people there. Uh, just like Daniel prophesied, then the Lord wants us to be aware that Adam himself will um, meet there with the saints uh, to be to instruct them. And I think that's really a powerful uh, verse. Yeah, we're looking forward to this. You know, John, who was it? I think it was uh, uh, Dr. Mike Wilcox who said um, – there's when part of partaking of the sacrament is yes, looking backward at the savior's life uh, and, and atonement, but also looking forward to this to the huge future, sacrament meeting. We're going to have future someday. feast. Yeah. yeah. This future sacrament meeting section 27, where uh, mm -hmm. that lists the people who will be part of this. Elijah and with Moroni. John, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. He said, Joseph, Jacob, Isaac, Abraham. I mean, these are the, the fathers <laughs> and of course their, their spouses, right? Uh, Sarah, Rachel, Rebecca, um, just uh, Peter, James, and John. I mean, uh, we look forward to this. To, to a this. big sacrament meeting someday. Right, yeah. There's a, a little, there's a statement that Sister Susan Easton Black made in her book. She's got a book called 400 Questions and Answers about the Doctrine and Covenants. And she said, section 116 is the first mention of Adam on Diamond in Holy Writ. However, the name Adam on Diamond was familiar to Latter-day Saints before the revelation was received by Joseph Smith on May 19th, 1838. For example, the hymn, Adam on Diamond by W.W. Phelps, was sung at the Kirtland Temple dedication in March mm. of 1836. So I, I, I didn't know that. The hymn was written before this revelation. So yeah. somehow that phrase, Adam on Diamond, was known before. The, the importance of that section to me is the fact that the Lord is really connecting the, uh, the spiritual history yeah, of, Adam, of that place. Yeah, Daniel. of Adam. It, it, it tells you that um, once upon a time he was there and also uh, the spiritual future of what will take place there. So when when it, it, it seemed that the church was in the brink of collapsing, um, I think this revelation reminds us that, uh, it reminded Joseph and the saints that there's something sacred that will take place in the church. And for um, all of the, our Father in Heaven's children. That's that's a remarkable revelation given the context of seeing everything that's going on with um, the apostasy. And the Lord said, you know, Adam will come and many of the prophets of old will be there too. So I don't know if, it's, if it sounded like, are you kidding me? Is this really going to happen? Especially given the, the current situation. But, um, but it will. The Lord said it. Speaking of just the broad view the Lord has, in fact, in the last section, section 115, he, he said that thy light may be a standard for the nations. He's, he's not just thinking of, of Kirtland or Far West or Jackson, but a, a real future view that we're going to take this gospel to the nations. Yeah, that's that's great. Uh, both of you. I'd never seen that section in that way, but uh, I think you're right on there, Franz. The idea that they maybe are a little shaken by what's happened over the last year and the Lord saying, no, 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 uh, the future's still in place. Uh, <laughs> almost like a little patriarchal blessing reassurance for the church, right? It's still on well on its way to what it needs to become. And there's probably times where uh, where all of us need to have that reassurance that the church is well on its way to its destiny. Uh, nothing is right. What would, what is the standard of truth? No unhallowed hand can, can stop, stop the work, the from, work progressing. from progressing. Yeah. No, I like the one where, uh, man might as well put forth his puny arm and stop the Missouri in its course. Right. <laughs> <laughs> then to stop the revelation from coming, that's, that's coming up later on. You know, and then to, to talk a little bit about this um, in our context today in 2021, 
um, you sometimes hear a lot of people sen- uh, trying to be sensational about, oh, members are leaving the church and groves and and um, what's going to happen to the church or or we don't like what President Nelson and the first presidency uh, sent us pertaining the the vaccines and the and and the masks and and we don't like what Elder Holland just said uh, during Brigham Young University and, and there's so many so many different things that you hear and then sometimes people fear in their hearts that oh what's what's happening to the church and um, is it going to still be there is it going to be solid or are we going to have a bunch of members leaving um, and to your point Hank. Um, the Lord has already, we know the end of this saga. There's no surprises, right? The It's been written in the Holy Scriptures. It's been prophesied. We know the end of the saga. We know that the Lord comes. Uh, there is a second coming. We know that when he comes back, he will find his church healthy. The people who will keep their covenants will keep their covenants. Sure, in between those, there are going to be ups and downs disappointments, heartaches, but a lot of joy too. A lot of laughter, just like what you were saying, John, when you went to the to the uh, the ward picnic. There's a lot of laughter, even though there's some difficulties. But my, my testimony in all of this has been strengthened to know that the Lord will find his church the way that he said. It will be a standard. And this will be because of the good men and women and children who would have kept their covenants or who are keeping their covenants. So it's really um, uh, a powerful reminder that that things are moving forward, although there will be bumps in the road. Yeah, um, I think it'd be a great time. I want to read this. I know I know both of you know it. Uh, and it's uh, our producer, uh, our producer, Steve and Shannon Sorensen. Um, it's the it's maybe their most beloved saying of the prophet. The standard of truth has been erected. No unhallowed hand can stop the work from progressing. Persecutions may rage. Mobs may combine. Armies may assemble. Calumny may defame. But the truth of God will go forth boldly, nobly and independent till it has penetrated every continent, visited every clime, swept every country and sounded in every year till the purposes of God shall be accomplished and the great Jehovah shall say the work is done. I, I, it's been written. The end has been written uh, and it's the church is well on its way uh, to that end. Wow. I, I love that that came out of section 116, this small little, this small little, uh, you know, six lines of, of scripture. To give a, some some more insights here, when we read Revelations in context, um, and pr- uh, during the section 117, um, we learned that throughout the summer of 1838, the saints continued to gather to far west in Adam and Ammon and other Mormon settlements in the northern Missouri. And I use the word uh, Mormon, but I should say the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints right. settlements, <laughs> right? Uh, in accordance with the commandment to build far west, uh, the cornerstones were laid for a temple in that community. And in soon a site had also been selected for a temple in that uh, location. Now, the interesting thing of this is that the peace and abundance uh, the saints were enjoying in northern Missouri was short-lived. Uh, there were mistrust and suspicion between the Missourians and the Latter-day Saints. Uh, and then violence erupted in August of 1838 and a series of armed conflicts known as the Missouri, it's, it was called as the Missouri, quote, the Missouri Mormon War com, uh, culminated with the imprisonment of Joseph and the expulsion of the Latter-day Saints from Missouri. So, so a lot of things are, are happening. There's a short-lived uh, rejoicing. And yet, you find that the saints are continuing to move forward. In section 117, uh, the Lord, um, and it, it's, it's, there's some great verses I want to highlight there, but the Lord tells them to keep at it, even if they seem that they're, they're not winning this battle. Uh, I, I think that that's exactly right. They're going to have this little moment of peace, almost the eye of the storm. And then it's going to pick back up uh, again. And that yes. that's life, isn't it? I mean, I would love to say the Lord 
we go through this difficulty and he says, okay, you're done for a while. Just have a, a good solid 10 years of peace. Uh, and it's not to be, uh, it's a good solid 10 days of peace. Uh, and, <laughs> and then they, the storm picks back up again. And that's something that is mortality, isn't it? That's, that's life, <laughs> which is, you know, I, <laughs> it's hard. It's really hard. The Lord is not letting, 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 um, Although things are very difficult, I should say, he's still instructing his saints to be good, right? Um, in verse 4 in section 117, he says to the people, he says, let them repent of all their sins and all of their covetous desires before me, saith the Lord. And I love that statement. For what is property unto me, saith the Lord. So there are a, lot of, a little bit of mistrust. People are coveting their property. They're wondering, okay, this is mine. And then the Lord is saying, hey, guys, let's, uh, we could do better. We could be better. And, and uh, to, to know that we're building the kingdom of God and not, we're not building you. We're, well, yes, we're building you in a way, but we're also building the kingdom of God. Right. We're not building the kingdom of Smith. Here. That's exactly uh, right. Right. Yeah. For what, I exactly like that right. question. For what is property unto me? I, he's no, kind of, <laughs> I'm, uh, I the so earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I, yes, he's got it all ready. And I like too that the as he continues in in verse six, it it's kind of the all flesh is in mine hands, but it's a little longer version of that. I made the fowls of the heaven, the fish of the sea, the beasts of the mountains. Have I not made the earth? Do I not hold the destinies of... It's like, I haven't lost my power. My son and I like to look at nice trucks. <laughs> we like to look at nice trucks. So when they drive by, he's like, Dad, look at that truck. And I'm like, oh, that's a great truck, right? I, and we, <laughs> we, uh, we have, I think there's a little covetous desires there, uh, right? And I can hear the Lord saying, what is a Ford F-150 unto me? Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a toy, Hank. It's, you know, <laughs> stop. <laughs> Repent of all their sins and all their covetous desires. Um, wow. That, that's... That's a reality check, isn't it? Yeah, it really is a reality check. And uh, I was laughing hard at the Ford 150 because I love cars, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and sometimes, unfortunately, I find myself coveting about some cars. But the reality check that you said is, um, is, is really true. Um, when I read those verses, or particularly that, that, that part of that verse, it just reminds me really that that if we focus on the Lord, th the promise is that everything that he has will be ours. I if that's, if that's of, if it's something that is consuming our thoughts of what will I get? Well, the Lord tells us that everything that's mine will be yours. Uh, meanwhile, focus on what's important. Um, helping my children find the, 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 their path, helping them returning back and, and, um, and supporting them. Uh, when when they go through difficult times, it just reminds you that we, his children, are really the central part of his mission to bring our immortality and eternal life. So, please join us for part two of this podcast. <laughs>